If billionaire businessmen in Russia know what's good for them, they will stay out of politics. That is the message delivered by the prolonged imprisonment of the former oil and gas oligarch Mikhail Khodorkovsky. So where does that leave my guest today? Alexander Lebedev is vastly wealthy thanks to investments in banking, aviation and property. He's also building a media empire and seems to hanker after a political role. But how carefully does he have to tread in Mr. Putin's Russia? Alexander Lebedev, welcome to Hard Talk. Good afternoon. You are a member of Russia's economic elite. You have a contact book to die for. So why did you decide just a few days ago to fight in a tiny seat in a Russian local election and become a local Russian councillor? Well, I have my history of running various elections. One of them was 2003 against Lushkov, then the mayor of Moscow, then Sochi, uh, 2009. Relatively big posts. And now uh, you've gone down <laughs> to the most yeah. local level in a, one of Russia's poorest regions. I hope I found myself an adequate place to try to change something for good. I was always interested in actually local, the way the local community, mm, executive and parliamentary legislative powers are being run the mostly neglected part of the democratic system we're trying to build in the country. I ran a direct election. Now we 20 deputies elected by 30,000 people with a 55% show up are gonna be electing the head of the executive, head of the region. You say you want to see if you can make democracy work better. You in your blog said, it'll be interesting to test myself, to make a pilot project and see if modernization is possible. Do you think there is something deeply unhealthy about the political culture in Russia today? Well, that's common knowledge. Uh, we have quite a lot of things we need to change in the parliamentary system, like controls over the executive, corruption, judicial system, proper election. I have to tell you, this election was pretty proper. I mean, I gained, I, I won my seat with just 20 votes. There was quite a few black PR leaflets stamped on the local houses, speaking in my voice, as if I'm sort of a, uh, with huge disrespect to the locals, are trying to convince them to vote for me, I'm telling them I've got lots of money, I'm going to make more money here, and then I will become the deputy of the of the um, national parliament uh, and steal all of the sort of a, um, all of the local product, which is mostly wood, you know, some agricultural stuff. But they uh, tended not to listen to what they've read on these leaflets. Uh, I think to the, you, on, you on the say, other side. You say there is no doubt that there's plenty wrong with Russian politics. Would you agree with the statement that was made by Mr. Khodorkovsky, whom I referred to in the introduction, when just before he was sentenced to his latest term of 14 years at the end of last year, he issued uh, these very strong words. He said, the conclusion from my case, my fate, is chilling. The Siloviki, that is the elite, the, the former KGB security establishment elite running Russia, he says, can do anything. This is a sick country that holds its own citizens in contempt. Do you agree with that? Well, that's, uh, that's uh, a view held by the newspaper I have been publishing for years the biggest opposition in newspaper Nova Gazette. Yes, I do agree. On the other side, I think we have moved ahead a very long way. We can freely travel, we can do business, which was a taboo under the Soviet Union. We can speak out. I mean, it's a bit restricted. I wish we could have more opportunities to speak out on the TV like doing here in BBC. But yeah, Mr. We do have a few obviously cannot speak out because oh, he's no, in no, prison no, and will be until 2017. Look, we have been giving floor to him. The last interview he has given was to us in December. Uh, we have a few main radio channels. There's quite a few small TV programs.
privately controlled or companies, it has to be improved, clearly. There is a debate. For example, I am in favor of having more direct and fair elections, uh, of more independent judicial system, of much more independent TV stations. I mean, a few people in Kremlin who would say we shouldn't be rushing into things. Uh, but I still think we are moving on the right track well, as a country. Seems There's to me still a long way to go, though. You're sort of hedging your bets, then. You're saying we've got a lot of problems. You were inclined to agree with the notion that Russia is a sick country that holds its citizens in contempt. But then when I push you a little bit, you say, you know what, we're making some progress. Your own friend and your partner on your newspaper, Novaya Gazeta, Mikhail Gorbachev, he said to the BBC recently, directly about Putin and Medvedev, he said, they are doing everything they can to move away from democracy and stay in power. Do you uh, agree Gorbachev, with that? Gorbachev said, it's not fair enough. We're going to sit down and agree between ourselves who's going to win the election. Uh, well, I think that's, uh, that's the wrong way to put it. Uh, but, but finally, the point, the point is, are, you prepared, are you prepared to say the problem goes to the very top? It does go to Vladimir Putin himself. That means that I need not to give any credit to put into what has been done for good in the country. No, but it, when it comes down to a judgment, and if you agree with the concept that Russia is, for the moment, a sick political society, it comes down to a judgment of whether Putin's overall influence is deeply negative and malign for Russia. You're oversimplifying things. I think, for example, the growth of, of, of income, personal income, of everyone in the country, including those who depend on the budget, has been partially his achievement. And I've noticed a big change in the recent year, since the, they, 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 they became sort of a little bit competing between each other, I mean Putin and Medvedev. For example, I've just signed a letter before leaving, which went to the Russian government, US government and the British government. And it's a simple proposal. I'm owner of two frequencies of FM stations, which are on air in Moscow. Now, the BBC is closing the Russian service because of the budgetary cuts, and I understand why the austerity measures are implied. Now, if the UK government, before David Cameron coming in July to Russia, and I, I, the letter was addressed also to Michael Mukfall, which is Obama's advisor on, 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 on Russia, and uh, Surkov, who is the deputy head of the administration. We can give an air to BBC, on, on one of the best frequencies you can get in Moscow, and to Voice of America, and keeping up the other part of that to Nova Gazeta on radio. But this is a political decision because I need to change my license, and my license, uh, giving more floor to, to talks rather than music, is a political issue with the Russian government. I mean, I wouldn't volunteer that a year ago, believe me. The, the, the relations, or two years ago, between the United States, Britain, and Russia were such that I'll be just reprimanded. I'm reprimanded for anything, well, you're anyway. suggesting there's a, there's a wind of liberalization blowing through the it, Kremlin. It, it's clear that. Whether it's it clear, is, isn't whether, it? Whether no, it, it's, on, it's on the on. same Otsipil like in the 60s under Khrushchev, which ended up wrongly. I don't know. Well, but then, I let's examine this wind of liberalization. You, yourself, in your other business, you've talked about your media, but of course, perhaps your biggest business is your control of, of one of Russia's leading banks, the National Reserve Bank. That bank, late last year, was raided by uh, a number of armed, masked security officials. You have since been called in for questioning. There is enormous pressure being put on your business, and you've described that as coming from an organized mafia within the state. Yes. Uh, I would even go further. I've just published a big interview in one of the main newspapers, which is called Komsomolskaya Pravda, and I'm saying there's nothing political in it because the rumor in the city that I'm attacked because of Novaya Gazeta and because I do speak out. I don't believe that. You don't think, believe that? I think what we need, we need a law the way it exists in the United States, which is called RICO, Racketing Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, uh, which can be applied against organized crime like that, where people in Apollets, that used to be in the United States in the 30s as well, this law actually came from real practice in the United States. But I don't think this is politics. This is corruption at, at the very, very senior level. But you're implying so that the, if it's corruption, it can't be politics. Surely the two in Russia go together. We've seen them go together for an awful long time. And when you wrote an open letter to Vladimir Putin asking him to call off the werewolves in 
epaulets, surely that was an implicit recognition that in the end these things only happen because Putin allows them to happen and if he doesn't want them to happen he can call them off. This letter is still on the table and I've addressed also the, the President. And what I asked was really to send me more reinforcements, not only the police, but also the special, we now build up a, a local FBI, which is a special investigative bureau under the prosecutor's office, and the accounting chamber. Uh, if that's being sent, that, my point, will be proven. But has, and has, also has, have Putin, not responded, exhausted. has Putin responded not to yet, Not yet, not yet. I wonder why. It takes some bureaucracy. Well, I've sent the letters like... Uh, I, forgive me, but three or Mr. Four, Putin four, is the Prime Minister. He is the man with the greatest power in Russia. You're telling me that he's being slowed down by a bit of bureaucracy. Surely the message here, just as it was... This is, this is an official letter, which is under the process of being prepared. Um, I, I, I still hope to get some answer. Let me put it and this I way. I haven't exhausted all of the opportunities I have in the judicial system. So my point is that I'd better exhaust every level of the judicial system to protect my freedom as a businessman or, or my freedom of speech as a, as a publisher until I sort of come to the point that I will get out of business and go into politics to prove another point. I haven't come to, the, to, 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 to that um, yet. Well, let's wait and see whether I'm right or wrong. And you, believe, you believe in the judicial system, do you? The judicial system that, uh, that imprisoned Khodorkovsky for 14 years? I just get years? some very little comfort in actually a judge ruling that my bank should not be closed by the fireman for three months, but should be rather um, penalized with, 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 a, with a small sum of money to be paid as a penalty to the court. And this judge really um, did have a lot of responsibility on his shoulders, because if something goes wrong in the building, the building is highly sophisticated, but the idea was to close the bank uh, and it was part of the raiders attack. They don't even only use the mask raids, they're also using the firemen when it's necessary. But the judge ruled in my favor. Just to tease out, again, this delicate balance I think you're trying to tread, let's return to your newspaper for a moment. There are some very brave journalists on your newspaper, Novaya Gazeta. One of them, of course, was Anna Politkovskaya. She was murdered in 2006. Who do you believe was responsible for that? Uh, we are not yet aware of who ordered that, but... That is the point, we have isn't it? Nobody I've spoken we have to on your newspaper believes that the people who ultimately are responsible for the decision to have her killed have ever been brought to justice or indeed ever will be. You know, all over the world these things happened. You know, the, 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 those who killed Kennedy were arrested, but we still are not aware who ordered that. But we still hope, we still hope that we will find out one day and in but this, we know in this particular we know case, the law Russia. enforcement agencies... No, Stephen, I, I frankly do not believe that. I have my, my own private opinion. Who did it? Uh, I think the law enforcement agencies are on the right track, and they did a good job on this particular point. So I hope one day we find out who ordered the killing of Anna Politkovska. One of your own journalists uh, said something very interesting recently to the Guardian newspaper, Yulia Latinina. Mm -hmm. She said... Um, Alexander is, is smart. He knows that if he does anything to really offend the people in power in Russia, there will be punishment. Implication... She's a brilliant journalist, but um, sometimes a brilliant journalist is picking up something, a phrase, which is very catch-eye. I mean, yeah, I'm, I am running some slight risks. For example, when Marie Dzhevsky in Independent publishes a big article which is very friendly, comforting, and I would say even complimenting, but she has her reasons for Putin. I'm being attacked in this country. Now, when Novaya Gazeta goes against Putin uh, about a castle which has been built for a billion US dollars, somewhere in the, in the Caucasus, then I'm being attacked there. But you know, I, I do survive and I publish in the newspapers and my business is being under attack, but I find my ways to defend myself. That means there are some... Because you just pull back when it comes 20 to years ago, that I wouldn't have this chance to go for Putin. Like, for example, another man I interviewed recently on this program, Boris Nimtsov, who has decided to go for Putin. He calls him a criminal, a thief. He's actually trying to take him to court. He says that one day Putin will have to he face might, the music in an independent He might as well run for courtroom. the president next year. Meaning this campaigning is, is part of the, of, of, of the future struggle for, for the position of the president in the country. But and I come back way, to this point. Nemtsov says to me, he says, in the end, if you want to fight for freedom, real freedom and democracy in Russia, you have to put yourself on the line. You have to, in the end, be prepared to take 
the punishment that may come your way. Are you prepared to make that final step? Do you think I would be, uh, for years, publishing Novaya Gazeta or get more involved in, in, in doing the same things internationally? Well, that's what I don't know. That's where I come back to Ms. Latinina and her belief that you know just how to avoid making that final step, to avoid the punishment that might come your way. And maybe, she doesn't say it, but maybe people will think, well, in the end it's because Alexander, he was in the KGB. There is a sense in which he and Putin grew up together. He's actually got a relationship with Putin that is much more complex than meets the eye. I was not in the KGB, I was in foreign intelligence. So these ominous letters, which, which are related to abbreviation to the gulag and, and repressions of the 30s, has never been part of my job. Now, I never knew Putin when I was in the service. The last time I saw him was nearly four years ago, when I was still a member of parliament. And we discussed, actually, the law which he heavily supported, which was a law to restrain, and finally it, it came down to a prohibition on the gambling. He also supported my, my, my move on changing the criminal code on the plea of bargaining, which is very heavily used now against fighting corruption. Now, in both cases, he made written decisions to support me as a lawmaker. Um, whether I decide to follow Mr. Nimtsov, well, I'm not in politics yet. There might well, you be, are, they actually. Might time. As we discussed, you're in politics at a local level. Uh, and I suppose what Russians might be interested to know is whether you are interested in using that as a long-term springboard for the sort of political career that might actually present a challenge to united Russia and the status quo. Well, if I can do something positive for 30,000 people down there in the woods in Kirov, which it takes you 14 hours by train, and you could not properly reach it by airplane, let's wait and see. But it's going to take me probably four or five years at least. Even if I go for potato or affordable individual housing construction made out of OSB-oriented sideboard, which is not produced in the Russian Federation, it's typical American style of houses, but he, let's wait and see. It's a bit premature. Well, let's wait and see. And let's actually cast our eyes now to a different part of your business empire. That is your decision to invest tens of millions of pounds in building a media empire of sorts in the United Kingdom. You own the independent newspaper. You own the standard in London. Neither of them you've bought for profit, clearly, because they don't make profits. They lose money. Have you done it just to keep a safe haven, in a sense to give yourself an extra level of protection if things turn really nasty with Putin? No. no. First of all, I don't see any protection coming from um, it makes you some a, additional a, it headaches. It makes you a high-profile player in, in the world of media and politics in the UK. But listening to what you've been saying, I mean, from what I've heard, I, I doubt that would stop anybody of, of, of not going ahead in your side, kind of a repression sort of a sphere against me. No. Uh, I just wanted to save Independent, and I wanted to save Evening Standard. I think the guys, for example, Geordie Gregg, who is uh, heading um, uh, Evening Standard, did an excellent job. From what I hear in the city, uh, we don't get a copy back from 650,000 copies in some of the Because we should tell stations. people around the world, you decided to make this newspaper, London's newspaper, entirely free. You give it away now. A lot of people said that was insane. They said that that, as a business model, was a one-way ticket to bankruptcy. Is that your vision of how you can make content pay? Far from creating new paywalls and new digital ways of monetizing content, you seem determined to make it totally well, free. Were we not brave enough, we would be facing ourselves now roughly with uh, 30 to 40 million pounds loss by the end of the year. This way, forgoing some of the sales revenues and earnings, we probably, we hope, we're going to be break even by the end of the year or first half of the next year. This is an excellent result. But is it sustainable in the long run? Because all the trends show that, that newspapers may well be a dying industry. More and more advertising revenue in the end is going to online. So can you keep this we, up? We have to be catching up with the online. And in fact, we had a board this, this, this morning, which was dedicated partially to how we combine all of our resources in online. Uh, we are very good with figures, financial results in, in, in Evening Standard. In Independent and I, which is our 
a sister a new, paper with 170,000 copies now. Yeah. Yeah, 20p. And is this going to be 30p something on Sunday <laughs> on, on on Saturday? But actually it's interesting mm -hmm. the, the, on this question of newspapers and their future. Do you want to make all of your newspapers free? Do you want to make the independent free as a newspaper in the long run? Not yet. Not yet. First of all it definitely can affect the other broadsheets in the market, which is not my intention. But you wouldn't, I mean, you you don't wouldn't get, weep if you won market share, would you? Yeah, but that was not a business... I mean, the, the, the perception sometimes that, the, the, that you're making a lot of money and you know, only after that. Now, I'm not interfering into, into the content, and it was not my idea. If we become break-even, I'll be the happiest person in the world because that makes it the business sustainable and if anything happens to me as a source of, of additional subsidy, it will go ahead. The journalist will work without me, which is excellent. But it's anyway, my input into it is tiny. It's well, just money. Money <laughs> there's plenty of ways to throw the money out of the window. Sure, but they like I did in Germany speaks, with airlines. There speaks a very successful billionaire. When you say to me, I'll be very happy if this particular part of my operation breaks even, it makes me even more convinced that there's a strong element of the vanity project about your newspaper ownership and maybe a strong element of wanting to ensure that in the end you always will have a bolt hole in the United Kingdom if, as I said earlier, things go badly wrong in Russia. It was not a plan anyway. If you're driving me to the point of, of admitting that I have improved my reputation by actually making some, some intellectual capital on, on other journalist work, but my input into no, it I'm is, not doing as I that, said, Mr. Liberty, I'm, 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 what I'm, I suppose, driving you to uh, consider is whether, with the possibility, real possibility, that Putin will stand for president again in 2012, he could have two more terms of six years, he could be president until 2024. In that context, I'm asking you to consider whether, in the end, it may be that your future lies in London, not in Russia. No, no. I think my future lies in actually bringing the two countries closer together and traveling between them. Uh, I also think that whatever it is, whoever becomes the president, be it Medvedev or Putin, and I don't think we have any other options at the, at, at, at the moment, but who knows? I mean, um, we will be still moving in Russia more to a European model of, of, of the society being organized. You're an optimist. With a proper division of powers yes. and with a proper judicial system. Yeah, I am an optimist, finally. I've lived in the country without optimism for too long, not to be one. And I would quote Sakharov as saying, would you believe they're going to ask him in, in the communists being dismantled? No, I won't believe that. Why is that you're fighting against us? Because I hope. So the fame, <laughs> same refers to what I think about the future of my country. Well, with that thought about hope, we have to end. Alexander Lebedev, thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you.